All right. Can everyone hear me okay? Even in the back? Awesome. Thanks, friends, for being here. Um, this is my very first time ever speaking at B-Side Salt Lake City. I've been a part of the community here for a long time. Um, even the first time, I think Bryce uh, kind of helped start the whatever, just do B-Sides one year. Um, I helped with the CFP that year, and I thought, man, I am way too nervous, and I'm way too scared of a person to actually go up and speak. And so it's taken me that long to finally get up here and hopefully share with you some things that will help all of us learn together. So um, today, uh, again, I appreciate you taking time to come listen and uh, struggle through what I will hopefully do and convey this talk to you. I listen to podcasts on 2x speed, so I usually talk at 2x speed, so hopefully you're able to <laughs> keep up here. I'm told to slow down because it actually gives a better experience for you, um, but I'll do my very, very best here. <clears throat> um, today I want to cover three different things, just the pathways to CISO. I'm going to use that in quotes largely because every journey is different. Uh, next, just talk about the role intensity and demands, and then hopefully just share some anecdotes and principles and experiences that will help you in your careers. If you're considering becoming a CISO at some point in your career or a security leader, remember leadership is not necessarily analogous to a title. Uh, we can influence and help others wherever we are at in our own roles. So for me, I'm a huge Fast and Furious fan. Um, and uh, you know, one principle that I've realized throughout my entire career is I seem to live my life a quarter mile at a time. If you look at my LinkedIn, it's like, Matt, it's like you got a pogo stick, you jumped here, 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 what's going on here? Just know, and we'll talk about it a second ago, er, in a second, that's very intentional. Um, every career decision I've made has been very intentional and very founded on the why behind that. But if you feel this way, you're not alone. Um, just know that I think I usually think two years ahead and thinking, hey, what's the right next step here? What's, how are things going here? All of that's usually driven by my own personal drivers, and I'll talk about that in a second as well, about making sure you discover your own drivers and how you make your own decisions. But this message isn't to say to go about life or your career haphazardly or flippantly. Uh, just know that life is short. Um, you want to be a part of things that matters, and you just own every second. So your career is your own, and I want to feel like you're always in the driver's seat of your career. Uh, for me, speaking of being in a car, um, where did I start my journey becoming a, you know, where I'm at in my role right now? Uh, about nine years ago, I was sitting in a car in the Adobe parking lot. I think uh, Nathan and Lonnie Bates were sitting in the car with me. I was on the phone with uh, the CFO at MX negotiating my offer to be MX's next director of security. This was about two weeks after I had just accepted a counter offer for a prior offer from the same company with Adobe to say, hey, Matt, we want you to stay. We'll give you this title. We'll give you a different you know, compensation package. It was great. I, I accepted that. And then two weeks later, I was like, wait. No, no, Matt, like, this is your goal. You want to become a security leader. It was actually at that point in time that I realized I love this domain of security. I love to help others, and I love to help contribute and secure meaningful causes. When I realized that, it was like, oh, well, let's say yes to this role. And that's when I started off my career journey to becoming um, a CISO. Uh, this is my career journey. I share it with you. I'm going to share a few others as well. Again, none of the same. Uh, and it's actually kind of fascinating to see the differences between all of them. Um, I got my Master's of Information Systems, and then after that went to Ernst & Young to be a consultant there, then went to AWS to help start their compliance program um, and, and go there, so heavy on the compliance space. Uh, went to Adobe to help with their FedRAMP program and some of the other compliance spaces there. After that, that's when I was like, man, I really like the hardcore side of security. I want to jump in and learn that spot. So what better opportunity than to switch over to being a director of security and learning those things along the way? Um, after that, I uh, went to Instructure and then to Workfront, again, here's the pogo stick, to Weave, to uh, Lumio, and then now to Drata. Um, it's been a fun experience along the way to kind of experience and learn in every one of these roles in a different way. Actually seeing a couple of folks walk in from working with you at Weave was really heartening to see, well, there's a couple team members that work at the Weave and love the experience and working with all of you at wherever our journeys have intersected. Um, again, every single one of these moves was very intentional with strong reasons and they all matched my own personal drivers. Um, I do want to talk here about, mm, I'll show it in a second. In a second I'll show a diagram called the CISO mind map and it really like shows the various domains of this role and the things that we have to worry about. Uh, for me, I was heavy on the compliance side when I started my career. Uh, about when I went to MX is, is when I realized, oh my gosh, there are a lot of technical areas of the security world that I was not deep in. And so at that point in time, um, I connected with some really good friends, most of, the most of them from the Adobe space that taught me things like, hey, what does vulnerability management really mean? How do we actually deploy scanners? What are we supposed to do for security operations? How are we supposed to detect various threats that are hitting our organization? All that was a very steep learning curve joining MX in that part of my career, but uh, no better opportunity than jumping in the deep end to learn how to swim. 
I wanted to give a couple other CISO examples here of folks that have progressed through this role. One is Varsha. Um, she's right now at Prosper Marketplace. Again, started kind of in the big four space, consulting space. And then I saw, like, uh, I want to say mid-2010s, she went to found a couple of companies. And then recently just joined Prosper Marketplace. Again, longer durations of these companies, um, definitely learning along the way, but now leading security at a company, which is very, very cool. Another one's Brandon Greenwood. <coughs> Brandon got his BS in computer science and then jumped in to be a hardcore security engineer. Again, stayed more on the hardcore technical side of things, um, continued to progress. He has spent, I think, a good 12, 13, 14 years at uh, Overstock, which was just acquired by Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, cool to see him progress in that role and now continue to inherit more and more of even some of the operational aspects of that organization. So again, I share as another example here uh, of someone else in their career journey. Another one's Mandy. Mandy's the CISO of Elastic. Uh, again, uh, I, these seem to be big four started. This was not the intent. It was largely to show various current CISOs in their role have different progressions here. Now, Mandy, um, you know, while she started the Ernst Young big four route uh, in Deloitte, uh, went to become a security officer and then CISO, security officer as well. And now is really cool to see her both uh, be a CISO at Elastic, but also advise a number of other companies. Now, this slide is definitely a massive amount. These are all CISOs. These are not all the CISOs. <laughs> there are definitely thousands out there. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll have their various backgrounds that you can go look up on LinkedIn, learn from, and see what things they did to kind of navigate this journey to this space. All of this is, this is what I was mentioning before, it's called the CISO mind map. In a second, actually I'll show it now. This is actually the real CISO mind map. When you actually try to explode what is on the mind of a CISO in a map, um, the person that I want to give attribution to here is Rafiq Remen, who is at Verizon. He put this together. Uh, this seemed a little bit better to at least highlight in a nicer way the different domains that we worry about in this role. So as you're considering this role or being a security leader in the future, this is a lot. Um, every day as a human being, I look at this and think this is intense, and there is no other way to kind of describe the reality of this particular role. <clears throat> um, and so some of the things that are on this are like team management, business enablement, SDLC, security architecture, compliance and audits, legal and HR, risk management, automation and analytics. Um, new on the map, and that's kind of shown here on the, the left-hand side in the red, is um, AI and Gen AI and having to secure all of our use of that in both our product and by our people. Remote work, security team branding awareness, governance, identity management, um, security operations, which is that massive right-hand side at the top there, which has a number of domains in and of itself, and resilience. Um, not shown that many CISOs are starting to inherit is IT engineering, or sometimes called enterprise engineering, where they have a lot of the SaaS products that are used by your company. Um, not also on here is what I've learned in this role, being at Drata, being at a security company, um, has its own list of uh, demands on this role, working with customers, uh, being up here on stage, uh, which is what I usually call the thing that keeps me up at night the most as a CISO, which most would actually attribute to a breach. For me, it's being up here on stage. But uh, for you, I just share that the demanding on the marketing side, the sales side, the leadership side of this role uh, may not be as highlighted here that it just expands to the map. Um, where are Star Trek fans at? Any? Kobe Ashimuru, right? Um, the unwinnable scenario. Uh, when I saw this, I'm like, this is no different than being a CISO today. And actually, this is one of the things that, uh, middle of my journey, I realized, what is wrong with my mental health? Like, why am I suffering in this role? Which is not too far uncommon for many of the CISOs that I talk with in Slack channels, behind closed doors, about things that they also suffer with in this role. Thinking, oh my gosh, my back is killing me. Why is that happening? I'm under all this stress. What is going on? Um, realizing that, oh my gosh, we can literally do everything in this role and still get breached. Uh, and that reality is a deafening dissonance that I think hits every single one of us. So as a human, um, you know, a breach hits a fellow couple we saw, I think CISA just released about Sysense getting breached. And, 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 you know, obviously vulnerabilities with Palo getting dropped. It's like, man, it never stops. And we really are trying our very, very best. And so when I look at organizations get breached uh, or uh, CISOs in that role, I realize there's a human behind that. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with Kobe Ashimuru, uh, again, it's a, a, a famous fictional s simulation in Star Trek where the cadets are put through this unwinnable scenario where they're supposed to go and rescue um, basically a ship that is the Kobe Ashimuru that's stranded in the Cleon neutral zone. Um, and your mission is you get a distress call, you're supposed to go save them, but they're in the neutral zone, so the Cleons, they can get involved if you enter that space. And so it ends up you know, being this massive uh, 
test. And this test is it's supposed to be able to help um, assess whether that candidate or ca cadet is good at making difficult decisions under pressure, dealing with potential sacrifice, commandability, and crisis management. Um, and so in many ways, uh, we're put in this impossible situation as CISOs, but it's fun to be able to exercise ingenuity, ethical considerations, and leadership uh, all under this kind of pressure setup. So if that interests you, this is the role for you. <laughs> but I share this with you so you can also realize in, in, in a good way saying like, yes, while this sounds painful or impossible, it is very much a, a very, very uh, fun, fulfilling, and rewarding role. Um, and so today, I get to the point of just saying like, hey, you're nearly a third, I think this is a, a year or so ago, of CISOs uh, in their role are considering leaving their current organization, or nine and 10 report being moderately or tremendously stressed, and the average CISO tenure is just two years and two months. Uh, pretty opening uh, uh, kind of stats there, but I hope these help you see, hey, if you're considering this role, these are some things that uh, I, I realized along the way, and I wanted to share with you the rest of my talk today, just some various anecdotes that hopefully will help you in your current role or as you progress towards this role if it's one of your goals. Um, I really liked the last talk. It was very, very cool to hear the experience of a fellow security professional share their journey. And it was really neat to hear her um, and, and say, hey, like very vulnerably open, say this is what happened. And so I'm hoping to do the same thing here. So the rest of the talk, um, just like my brain bouncing all over the place, is gonna have a bunch of randomly cool anecdotes that have helped me kind of see where we're at. Number one, I mentioned the dissonance. Learn to live with the dissonance. Uh, in many ways, we're in this scenario of CISOs where, again, we can do everything and still fail. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I, I, I've been thinking on this one, I think there was like uh, three CISOs that were on a panel at RSA one year, and they were talking about, hey, what is it like being in the role of CISO? And I think all of them, within three months, all three CISOs had opted out of their big CISO jobs. <laughs> it was like, I'm done with this role. Um, at some point, I probably will opt out, um, but for now, it's fun being in the fight. I think, honestly, when people ask me what keeps me up at night, besides being up on stage giving talks, uh, is, uh, um, honestly, sleep pretty well because I'm surrounded by incredible uh, team members, many of them here, uh, even my own team that helps support and knowing that if anything happens, uh, we got each other's back and we're gonna work towards that. Um, learning to live with this dissonance has is, is been something that's helped for me. One uh, massive aspect has been meditation, mindfulness and awareness. Uh, just one of the, I think Sam Harris is the one that kind of helped me understand the purpose of meditation, which is not to become a good meditator, but to be more mindful of your surroundings and awareness of what's going on. This is extremely valuable when incidents happen or when stresses are happen or when I am feeling crumpy or when I'm, <laughs> whatever it may be, to be able to take a moment to relax, to understand and watch these thoughts and feelings process and pass like waves um, to be able to, again, survive, persist in this role. The CISO that I mentioned a second ago, a couple weeks ago, that's like, man, it's four o'clock, my back is killing me, this role is literally stressing out my body. Um, all of the recommendations on that were around mindfulness, going to take a walk, be able to just, just, just completely disconnect from work, take that time to process the feelings and pressure that you're experiencing in this role. I encourage all of you to do the same. This is awesome. There's great apps there, Headspace is another one. Awesome, awesome opportunities here. Um, following your own advice. Uh, you know, if your best friend were to ask you how he or she could live a better life, um, you would probably find many useful things to say, yet you might not live that way yourself. You know, so Sam Harris here was saying, wisdom is nothing more profound than the inability to follow one's own advice. Um, take some time to listen to yourself. Relationships matter most. Uh, in preparing for this, I reached out to Ryan Gurney. Uh, he's an operating partner at Wild Ventures, but also a former CISO at Looker. Uh, very, very cool human being. Uh, he, I was like, hey, you've been in this game a hell of a longer than I have. Like, you know, what really matters to you? And he's like, I, I concluded the rest here at the bottom, but he said, your network. And I couldn't agree more. Many people here are in my network, and I love these kind of conferences where we can connect with others. It totally goes in line with this book that was released a couple years ago called The Good Life. And basically, the thesis of this book was, and they did a longitudinal, it was the longest longitudinal study that they had done, and they thought, hey, what really stands out in differentiating our lives being better or fulfilled or happy? It was all relationships. So strong relationships were the strongest predictor of life satisfaction and better predictors of long and happy lives than social class, wealth, fame, IQ, or even genes uh, were strong relationships. And so strong relationships are not correlated with happiness, but with physical health, longevity, and financial success too. So our connections and how we interact with each other really matter the most. Um, it was fun listening to Kenny Scott uh, earlier today talk about OSCAL and the amazing work that he's doing over Paramify. Um, he mentioned, he's like, I learned this is the way that I learn. And when he said that, I was like, that's exactly right here. Like, the way I was able to get to where I'm at and many of my peers is they learned the way that they learn 
and they apply that throughout and we all learn in different ways. And having that will help multiple facets in your own role. For me, I realized not too, I will say a couple of years ago, um, you know, oh my gosh, like I do not learn well in these kind of settings where someone is talking to me. I learn really, really well in having a problem and then bashing against that problem and then having friends to be able to ask and say, I am approaching this problem, but I'm not sure why I am not able to overcome this. What are your thoughts? What would you do? And having trusted advisors and friends, again, like Ryan Gurney said, your network uh, was really something that helped me progress and grow. So um, last year I went to EDC, which is like down Daisy, Danny Car Daisy Carnival down in uh, Vegas, huge fan of EDM music. I saw the sign, it almost made me cry because I was like, we all need to create a space where all are welcome. And so as a leader in this role, being a person that actually helps all folks feel welcome wherever they're at with their diverse backgrounds, it's a leader's responsibility to make that a safe place for all of us. For me, I'm neurodivergent. Um, didn't find this out till recently with ADHD. I was like, oh my gosh, no freaking wonder. Many of you who've worked with me for 10 plus years are probably like, Matt, I could have told you that 10 years ago. <laughs> like, why are you getting this realization now? But it, and along that whole phrase of you know being a place and space where all feel welcome, as a leader, as a CISO, like foster inclusive environment, we all have our own funk. Um, and, and I thought, hey, with this being me, um, I think it's technically combined type hyper, hyperactive impulsive. Uh, I showed the CISO mind map. I see this graph right here. I'm like, no wonder I love this role. Like, it's never going to get boring. And um, I, I just want to make sure that, uh, th that this is a good space for all of us. Um, almost like this talk is bouncing around uh, uh, different things here. Um, I was talking with Josh years ago. It's Josh Blackwell there. He's a Sentinel One. Um, an incredible friend. I, I want to say five, four or five years ago, I was so frustrated about something at a company that I was at. It's like, why is this happening? And why are we not making progress? Or why is this not where we need to be at? He reminded me that, Matt, your mind, your mind and your brain is wired like a mechanical engineer, where we have zero tolerances or near zero tolerances when you manufacture items. Um, and he's like, you, you can't think that way in this role. You need to be able to think in a way where risk management is really driving your decisions and still have that little dissonance exist. Um, again, back to the mindfulness, noticing that dissonance exists in my life as a result of this role has helped me still cope with and survive in this role. So again, having a, a friend and network that has helped me, this has been one of those that has helped me. Um, one is writing out your program. Uh, this morning at nine o'clock, I spent time with our, um, you know, our, the security leader on my team that manages the security function, our program. I had written this out back in, I wanna say last summer. And very similar to what I've done at other companies, uh, at MX, at an instructor, I just jumped right in. I was like, we're just gonna do security things. I never actually wrote out the program. What I noticed though is when team members would join the team, they're like, wait, wait, what's the holistic drive of what we're trying to get here? And realized, I think, when I was at Weave, I was like, we need to write out what our actual security program is. What are the components? What are the functions? Who are the team members assigned? What are the successful outcomes? Taking time to actually write this out in a very strategic way was one that's actually helped drive very careful conversations with team members. So with Josh on my team, this morning we spent about an hour going through this, one double clicking in the security operations program. And I noticed there was a, there was a difference between what I was expecting and what he was thinking and this document helped align that this morning in a way that I hadn't seen before in this role. So I shared it with you so that you can spend time as you, when your leadership roles say, hey, this is what we're expecting, this is why. And what I love about someone like Josh is, and why I encourage it at work, is he is very, very good at telling me like, Matt, I don't agree, or I'm not sure this makes sense, or that was like 2012 security, we're in 2024, like how do we wanna approach this? And it was actually very, very helpful conversation to, um, to help us grow and align on the program objectives. Find good mentors, teachers, and close friends to decompress with. So Bryce, you know, he's one of my trusted advisors for the longest time and still is. Like, how do you literally X, and I would literally fill in any security topic. And Bryce will literally explain any security topic like I'm five, which is amazing. And then afterwards follow up, hey, you wanna go get wings? You wanna go to a movie? I love this level of decompression. A couple nights ago we were spending time, you know, just I think it was at uh, Trolley Winco uh, until, you know, midnight or, or later, just chatting about life in general, security stuff we talked about what's the next gen of sim looking like to, hey, let's talk about the, uh, the B-size thing coming up, whatever it may be. But having folks like this has really helped me grow and hope you also find similar connections to this to help you grow. So many people in this room helped teach me and I appreciate you. Um, I wish I could have all of you with a bubble here with a picture on it with a quote that you've given me because all of you have that and have shared that with me and I think that's incredible. I want you to continue to do that. Speaking of mentorship and my working with my team member earlier, you know, a mentor is not someone who walks ahead of us and tells us how they did it. A mentor is someone who walks al like alongside us to guide us on what we can do. Folks like Simon Sinek or Adam Grant or others out there have helped me in this leadership role learn some of these human skills to help me re 
focus, how I, uh, how I actually engage with my team members, and that's been awesome. I share that with you because many of you are going to be mentors or are mentors to friends. Um, walk alongside them. Um, learning your drivers is, is key here. When I was at a structure, they came out with a tool called the drivers or bridge drivers. This is the URL at the bottom. I encourage all of you to take a moment to go to the site or use a similar exercise to identify what your drivers are. These are mine. Um, I actually filled these out earlier this week to say, hey, what's my latest slice or cut of drivers that I have right now? These change over time um, and expect that. Some of these will be met, some of these won't be met. These actually help drive really healthy conversations with your leaders who may be in charge of your compensation or performance. These are also good conversations to have with your team members when you try to understand where they're at in their career to help them reach and grow as well. <clears throat> Um, so learn them and, and use that. These are what I use to actually decide, hey, should I stay in this role or should I move to another role? The only constant is change. The CISO role, Mandy mentioned this a few weeks ago, Opera Cyber up in uh, Park City. It's continuing to change. We're having to move from technical expert to business expert. We're having to go guardians of the gate to risk manager. All these different things are changing for this role and this role will continue to evolve over time. I will proudly admit that I'm a recovering asshole. Uh, Self-awareness is key here. And I share this very openly with you because well, I came straight out of Amazon. And Amazon is a very, very intense environment. And the way we communicate was not uh, one that I would be saying is favorable and one that was be connection building over time. And so that's a great picture. You should put that on my LinkedIn to say, hey, I'm just going to openly admit it. But the thing is, is um, this self-awareness on your own career journey is key. I had some team members pull me aside and say, Matt, you know, this interaction you just had with someone, uh, definitely not ideal. And, and I want to share that here so that you all know that we all have our own funk, we all have our things we're going to work through and grow through that. One, I'm going to skip to this one, is um, after a really tough interaction I had one day at MX, um, uh, you know, Brandon DeWitt, he uh, passed away a few years ago, and uh, <clears throat> he pulled me aside and said, Matt, uh, he said this, he said, you know, like, when we meet other people where they're at, instead of expecting them to meet us where we're at, that's where leadership is born. And so as you go on your own personal leadership journeys, remember this is meeting other people where they're at first versus expecting them to come to your direction. This is the same time that Brandon also drew a diagram on the board and saying, we all have our own ceilings. And he, he drew this graph and he's like, today you hit a ceiling and you keep bouncing up against that ceiling. But you know what? I know that you could actually burst through that ceiling and continue to grow in your career. Um, again, this was a number of years ago. <clears throat> and that's when my journey started to realize, oh my gosh, Matt, the way you engage with people is completely against your own values of wanting to connect with others. And so identifying your own drivers or your own values to help those kind of things and what you're doing to impede your ability to progress through that is, is absolutely key here. Um, I learned this the hard way to structure. One day I was really, really frustrated with how I think our DevOps team was working there and I was I publicly shamed them. I'm like, this is not the definition of ownership and this is not going to be a very much in a very public Slack channel. Publicly shame them. Like, and I have to say the fastest way to lose your credibility and influence as a leader is by publicly shaming another. And so uh, again, just, my dad told me he could learn things the easy way or the hard way. This is an example where Matt Hillary learned things the hard way. And I hope sharing that with you helps you learn it the easier way. Use capable AI, PI.AI. It's scary how good this is versus some of the talk therapy that's out there. Fun, fun way to basically, uh, uh, you can prepare for talks like that. You can say, hey, I'm really frustrated about this employer. I'm really frustrated about what we're doing here. Whatever it be, clockwise is another one. ChatGPT is super, super helpful in explaining things like Refive when it doesn't hallucinate. Um, and it's it's super, super helpful on the way. So I highly recommend this and a number of other AI capabilities are coming out now to help augment our ability to do our role as well. Um, Nathan's here. Uh, I'm in a number of, of signal conversations with some good close friends, and that's my safe place to rant literally about anything. And uh, Nate is very, very quick to pick up when Matt is triggered, and he'll say, Matt needs a hug. And that's usually a signal to me to say, Matt, you're triggered right now, you need a hug. And actually, it's surprising how much just needing a hug actually helps another. So remember that part as you engage with others. Um, last but not least, Life is short, precious, beautiful, experience the best this world has to offer. Um, I know in many ways this role can be extremely, extremely challenging and overwhelming, but hopefully sharing some of those anecdotes today will help you in your career. I'm sure you know, the hardest thing about preparing this talk was, oh my gosh, how do you take 15 plus years of experiences and distill it down to these things to help you know whether or not it's something you want to consider for your role. But um, honestly, it has been an incredible experience to grow, learn alongside all of you in, in getting to where I'm at and whatever the future holds here. But uh, one, I wanted to show this today. I hope these are helpful for you. Um, these are things, again, that I learned and will continue to learn. I know we're all on our own journey, and uh, hopefully these help. So for that, that's, that's what I wanted to share today. Hopefully it was helpful for all of you. Thank you.